Okay, and so um, we have another wonderful candidate as well. And so I now want to introduce Dr. Jamie Malaro. Um, she is a research scientist at the Planetary Science Institute studying weathering and landscape evolution on airless, icy, and rocky bodies. Uh, after receiving her PhD from the University of Arizona in 2015, she obtained a NASA postdoctoral program fellow at NASA's JPL, where she is, a ge where she is still geographically uh, based. Dr. Malaro is former participating science on NASA OSIRIS-REx mission and current member of the sample science team, as well as a co-I for the Survey Project Espresso team. She has received numerous awards and honors, including the NASA Planetary Science Early Career Award in 2023, and she was uh, honored with the naming of asteroid 30379 Malaro by the International Astronomical Union in 2021. In addition to planetary science, Dr. Malaro has always also performed research to advance accessible design in human spaceflight with Astro Access. She is also known for her public outreach efforts with Art of Planetary Science, which brings art and science together in exhibitions and workshops, and for her founding and leadership of Dis Disabled for Accessibility in Space, a peer networking for support organizations for disabled space professionals. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Malaro. Take it away. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there in person, um, but that wasn't possible for me today. Thankfully, we have technology. Um, I'm, of course, very honored to receive this award. and. Um, similar to Casey, I was wondering what I should talk about. When I asked Christina, you know, what I should talk about, whether I should talk about what I was nominated for or something else, and she said, well, you could do that. You could talk about newer work or something less technical. It's really up to you. And she said, you know, you can go watch the recordings of previous recipients of the award um, if you'd like to get a sense for what they did. And I said, okay, okay. And then I hung up the phone and immediately I thought, actually, I'm not going to do that because if I watch what other people have done, I am going to feel constrained to do the same thing. And I realized that actually this idea itself um, is worth talking about today. The idea of not being constrained in your career um, by the ways that other people think that you should be a scientist. And it's kind of been a theme for me in the last five years which um, have been very different for me than the five years before that. So I wanna bring you on um, a little tour of the different projects that I've been working on over the last five years. And I'm not gonna go in depth into any of them because that's not my point, but just to give you a sense of the different types of things I've been working on and why I think that that's valuable. So I'm gonna start in 2019 I was a participating scientist on OSIRIS-REx, and this was a very exciting time for me. Um, we arrived at asteroid Bennu uh, to survey the asteroid. And um, if you're familiar with my research, a, a lot of what I study is a process called thermal fatigue, uh, which is a mechanical weathering process driven by cyclic heating that drives like boulder breakdown. And when we arrived at Bennu, we found widespread evidence of this process all over the surface. Um, I cannot tell you how exciting it is to observe for the first time. This is the first time we've observed this process uh, directly on an airless body. Um, to observe for the first time a process which you in your PhD thesis helped convince the community definitely is real. So it was it was really um, personally fulfilling for me and very exciting time for my research. We we found these features called exfoliation flakes, uh, which is sort of a, a flaking of layers of material off the surface. Um, I do a lot of modeling, so we're looking at the stress fields in the boulders and how that should propagate cracks and and the spacing of those cracks. 
And then, of course, we discovered um, that there were particles being ejected from the surface of Bennu. And we said, well, during a disaggregation event from this exfoliation process, could that actually contribute to this process? So we used the model to predict the size frequency distribution and the speeds of the particles, and they matched observations really well. And so this was this was a very exciting time in, in learning to understand this process, in learning more about asteroid services, and my personal growth as a scientist. Now, fast forward, um, to, to now, and of course we have samples to study, and I'm working with the sample science team to look at how the mineralogy of these samples can contribute to um, the, the fatigue process, can contribute to the fracturing and the porosity that we're seeing inside the samples. So we're looking at like how the presence of things like sulfides and carbonates um, can produce stresses inside of these microstructures um, that then will produce some of the cracks we're seeing. We're seeing cool things like, like parallel sets of, um, of cracks here in regions that are depleted of inclusions. We're seeing cracks along the boundaries between depleted uh, regions and regions that have a, a lot of these um, sulfides. Um, and so, again, this is very exciting. This is ongoing work, so I don't have too many results to share, uh, but it's been really fun to work on. In addition to the modeling, um, I've been doing some laboratory experiments and looking at, um, we're, we're thermally cycling different types of rocks in the cryovac chamber at JPL, and we're quantifying the change in the mechanical properties of these rocks as they undergo thermal cycling as if they were on the surface of an asteroid. And um, we're monitoring how the mechanical properties of these rocks change over time, specifically um, looking at the, the Young's modulus, the elastic modulus, as a proxy for damage. And this allows us to kind of understand how uh, when you have an asteroid that's moving uh, into nearer space for the first time and, it, and it's starting to undergo this fatigue process, um, how might uh, it undergo, how might it, it uh, become weaker and introduce porosity uh, as that occurs? So this has been really fun. Our results, these are fresh measurements from a week ago, um, is that we we had several sets of um, rocks in the chamber and we measured uh, between a 20 and 35% reduction in elastic modulus in these materials as they underwent this thermal cycling process. So as they became weaker uh, and less brittle over time. Now, all of these, th these last couple of projects that um, I've been working on with the sample science team and the experiments have all been mostly in the last year. There's actually a lot of time between 2019 and 2023 um, during what I call, oops, the lost years. And this is sort of the, um, what I kind of want to focus on today about worrying about what I was doing during that time. And of course, the last years were were weird for everybody. In 2020, of course, the pandemic came and everybody's lives changed. Um, in my case, it wasn't just the pandemic itself. I had just come off of this very intense year of work with OSIRIS-REx. It was highly collaborative. It was, it was a high in my career in terms of the research that I was doing. Uh, and it was very intense. And then it ended kind of very abruptly when that phase of the mission was over for 2019. And I simultaneously missed it intensely um, and was incredibly burnt out. And then the pandemic began and I actually also lost my dog at that time. And I kind of went through this period where um, I just couldn't do science. I was having a hard time doing, you know, what I would think of as, quote unquote, real science. Um, and I did get involved in a couple of other projects um, that are very non-traditional research. But um, I was actually, I had a lot of anxiety about doing that. I was worried about how it was going to look to be working on these projects. How is it going to look when I have a gap in publications? for four years? How is it going to look when I'm spending a lot of time doing 
um, outreach or something that somebody else wouldn't consider, quote unquote, real science, was I going to be taken less seriously as a scientist? Were people going to forget that I actually know things about asteroids? What if I wasn't presenting enough at conferences? Um, and I'm glad that I didn't listen to those anxieties, um, even though they're there for a real reason. We very much live, uh, despite the progress we've made, our field is still very much um, driven by kind of a publish or perish model. Um, and despite the fact that things like outreach are becoming more valued, there's still those in the community who see people who do outreach as less than. And so I had all of these anxieties in my mind, but I did these projects anyways, because as much as I loved asteroids, I just couldn't think about them at the time. And I needed to do something that was feeding me um, scientifically and, and creatively. And I, and I really want to thank Survey for supporting this work. It's actually very difficult to get funding for non-traditional research. And I especially want to say thank you to Sandlin, Amanda, Alex, uh, and to the Espresso and Trex nodes for supporting this. So um, one of the things that I focused on during this time um, was embracing my own disability. Uh, it is a physical disability that is invisible. It's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome uh, or EDS. And um, unlike in Casey's case, my condition didn't really become an issue until I was in college. And at first it was okay, it was manageable, uh, but it has gotten worse with age. And I've had to learn how to balance being productive in my career with taking care of my body and being a functional human being. And learning to do that is, is challenging um, and can be lonely in a lot of ways. And disability is something we don't talk about a lot. So I started a small group called DIAS. Um, it's a peer networking and support group um, for people in the space community who are disabled or neurodivergent or chronically ill um, to meet each other and support each other and in some cases do advocacy. Um, if anyone's interested, please reach out in learning more. You don't need to use any specific terms to identify yourself to join us. Um, there's room for everybody. So through this, um, effort, I got involved in a project called Aster Access, um, which is actually run by a nonprofit called Sci Access Inc. And Aster Access is a human spaceflight project um, where we launched crews of researchers with different types of disabilities on zero gravity flights to test uh, accessibility accommodations um, that future astronauts might need in space. And at the time, this was something I was really interested in, something I felt passionate about, uh, and something that allowed me to broaden my reach and my experience within the disability community and to do some cool science at the same time. So um, I ended up as co-lead of the flight ops um, part of the project for two of their flights, and I led a team in developing the investigations that we would actually test on board the plane. Um, we asked that we had to ask the questions, what sort of challenges does weightlessness present to individuals with different disabilities and how can we mitigate them? Um, the research area is focused primarily on things like navigation, communication and orientation. For example, is sign language effective in weightlessness, especially if uh, you need to be using your hands to move around uh, inside the cabin or what tools can blind individuals use to maintain a sense of orientation when they're free floating? Uh, and you don't necessarily know what direction you're turning or moving. And so some of the things that we tested were um, sort of strategies and, and techniques. Some of them were actual things like, you know, physical things like haptic technologies, lights, flight suit modifications. Um, and we did finally publish a paper this year in ACTA Astronautica of the results of that flight. So for anyone interested, I encourage you to take a look. So um, this was a hugely fulfilling project, but again, not traditional research, um, but it was really, really fun. The other thing that I've spent a lot of time doing is um, art. Many of you know that um, I started an art show while I was in grad school uh, called The Art of Planetary Science, and this show features it's an annual event mostly 
Uh, we It features art inspired by science alongside art, which incorporates scientific ideas or data in some way. Um, and it offers the opportunity for the audience and for the artist to make a connection, a personal connection to science outside of an academic framework. And I'm really happy that um, in 2023, TAP celebrated its 10 year anniversary, which is really, really um, exciting for me. And um, the on the ground running of this show is largely done by current graduate students at the University of Arizona. I hang out in the background in case they need help. If you've seen art shows at DPS in recent years, I have done some of those. And the other thing I've done is expand um, what we're trying to do with these art shows with workshops. One of the things that uh, we found in doing the shows is that artists would come and they would talk to us and they would say, wow, I really love that you've provided this, this venue and this opportunity to engage with science with my work, but I don't know how to do that. And so these workshops are a way to engage artists directly um, in focusing on um, techniques and how to create science-driven art. Um, and importantly, this isn't just about appreciating science, it's about participating in it. So these workshops also focus on how you can use art as a tool for scientific inquiry. Um, this is about giving access to full access to science um, outside of academia and giving these artists um, permission is a lot of it, permission and tools to um, explore science uh, in their own context. Uh, and we also focus a lot on the role that artists can play in facilitating public discourse around space and our relationship to space, which is really important in society right now. So I've done two of these workshops, I'm doing a third one this fall. So, um, Again, this is just sort of a little tour of these different projects I've been working on. And things like these workshops and Astro Access are, are not traditional science, but I think most of you in this room, I would hope, would see that, that they are providing value um, to the community and to society. They produce a public good. And for me personally, they were very uh, rewarding. They are very rewarding. Uh, and they've allowed me to grow as a scientist. So. The thing that I want to leave you with today and the focus, I think, of, of what I'm trying to get across today is not to let other people's definition of science decide how you are going to do it or what you think makes you a scientist. The dimensionality that comes from experiences outside of traditional research will make you a better scientist. For those of you who are interested in doing work beyond traditional research, I encourage you to take that opportunity to do it. Um, and while I did end up getting publications out of both my artwork and Astro Access, um, a scientist is not the sum of their published works. And doing science doesn't have to mean the same thing for all people or for an individual at all points in their career. And I really want to encourage us as a community um, to embrace the ways that that benefits us and to acknowledge the contributions that those uh, efforts make to the field um, and to work to change our perceptions around how we're valued on paper um, versus you know, what we're actually producing and, and what science really is. And science, science can mean different things to different people. Um, and I look forward to doing both traditional research you know, going, I've come back around to asteroids for a while. I'm continuing to do this artwork and I don't know what's going to, you know, come up for me in the future or what I might work on down the road. Um, but I look forward to finding out. So thank you, um, for having me here today. Uh, thank you for honoring me with this award. And, um, thank you for all of your contributions in your different ways to, um, what we're doing as a scientific community.